Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure and honor to, honor to introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Smaller. He comes from the University of Rochester. He's the chair of, of Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And Dr. Smaller got his undergrad training in Dartmouth College and a medical degree from University of Cincinnati. Then he did his APCP training at Harvard and then the Medical Pathology Fellowship at Cornell. He started his academic career at Cornell, and then two years later moved to Stanford, and arranges, uh, rose through the ranks to the professor. So Dr. Smola is a great leader in pathology practice. He chaired the two great pathology department. He served as a executive vice president of USCIP, and also is the president, or was a president of the American Society of the Metal Pathology. I think most importantly, Bruce is a, a, is a great mentor. He trained many residents and the fellows. I think he's going to have two great sessions with our resident fellows. I think he, you guys are going to learn a lot from him. And also, he's a distinguished the metapathologist, has been lectured in many national and international meetings. He has received so many honors I'm not going to mention about it. And uh, more importantly, he's a great scholar, has published more than 200 papers. And today, he's going to tell us how to become an academic pathologist without spending too much of your taxpayer money, but it just, <laughs> but it just work hard and smart. And then you, 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 you really, you can learn his lecture to see how you can progress in, in through the ranks. Yeah, welcome, Dr. Smola. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that very gracious introduction. It just says how old I am. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's, it's a, quite an honor to be here. Um, I think this is the second time I've ever set foot in the state of Minnesota, so thank you for blessing me with not such terrible weather for the end of February. Um, it's already come up in discussion, so I'll just point to it right at the beginning. That picture at, at the, uh, over here, is actually a wax sculpture. It's not a human being. From 1880 to 1920 or thereabouts, the dermatology department at Hôpital Saint-Louis in Paris had on their dermatology faculty a wax sculptor. And whenever patients came in who had any kind of interesting disease, that is anything in dermatology, if you're a dermatology department, the wax sculptor would make a model of it. So you go into this room that's a typical European amphitheater where you're going to give grand rounds and it's going to be awesome and kind of prestigious looking. And you expect to see books lining the shelves of this area. And it looks like that, except that there are these glass cases. And when you go up and you look in the glass cases, they're thermally regulated, and there are wax sculptures, thousands of them there. It's really cool. So if you're ever in Paris for a weekend, don't go there. If you're ever there for six months on sabbatical, like I once was, what an incredible thing to say. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about basically my career as an academic dermatopathologist for what it's worth. Everyone always saves this slide for the end. I'm going to put it at the beginning. I couldn't have done any of this without all these folks, and there's probably lots of other folks that I should and could mention who've helped along the way with these hundreds of projects that we've done through the years. And so I just want to say right at the front, thank you to all these people for their collaborations. I'm going to talk about mycosis fungoides. I'll start off with something I said at Yale in front of Rick Edelson, who's the man who coined the term CTCL. I hate the term CTCL. I'll tell you why I hate the term CTCL. Why don't we just call it lymphoma or back up? Why don't we just call it cancer? CTCL doesn't mean anything. MF, mycosis fungoides, while it's a terrible name, it's neither mycotic nor fungoid, um, <laughs> at least tells us something. It's one type of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. It has nowhere near the same biologic behavior as an angiocentric T-cell lymphoma, where you're going to die. With mycosis fungoides, you're probably not going to die. So if you call it all CTCL, it makes no sense. I hate the term. What I'm going to do is take a look at studies we've done over the years looking at these different parameters in establishing, attempting to establish a diagnosis. So let's start with the, the clinical presentation. It's 
relatively common as far as cutaneous lymphomas go, by far the most common, but it's not a super common disease. About, uh, unlike lymph nodes, three quarters of all the lymphomas in the skin tend to be T cell lymphomas. And interestingly, the incidence seemed to double a lot over a period of time, but now most people think it's sort of stabilized. And for reasons no one really knows, it's twice as common in men. In California in the mid-1980s, they, they thought they saw a big influx of cases, or, and they decided this might be related to chronic pesticide exposure, and that hypothesis was run down for years, never showing it, but we'll come back to that later. Because it may play something with chronic antigen stimulation leading to a clonal expansion and MF. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Lots of these folks have second non-cutaneous malignancies, tend to be my age. You don't usually get this as a kid, though you can. Um, mostly it starts on the flanks and buttocks, but patients don't always read the textbook, so sometimes they come in with lesions that aren't there. And if they've read the textbook, it's an erythematous scaly patch that won't go away. And over literally decades, it may progress to an indurated plaque and then maybe to a tumor nodule, albeit in a very small minority of patients. Then there are different patients who read a different textbook where they get a poikilodermatous variant where instead of an erythematous patch, poikiloderma is a fancy word so that some of it's thick and some of it's thin and some of it's brown and some of it's white. It's all different patterns. And that's a different pattern of MF. The ones that are CD8 positive, I'll come back to that, may have more of this pattern. Then there are those where it looks like it's around hair follicles and those people have a different biologic behavior. They're a hypopigmented. The bottom line is lots of things get categorized as MF. Is it even one disease? I don't really know. Often, patients complain that they itch. It's not like other lymphomas in that usually you don't see lymph node involvement until very late. And then in the rare patient who dies from MF, you will see the kind of organ involvement you expect to see with the liver, lungs, spleen, et cetera. So can involve kids really young there was a study from the Mayo Clinic back in the 19, early 1990s showing that. But be careful. Don't diagnose glibly mycosis fungoides in a six-year-old. It's probably not. Could be. They look something like this, and this arcuate type pattern, according to Yun Kim, who is the dermatologist in charge of the MF clinic at Stanford, she thinks that's an absolutely pathognomonic thing, seeing that arcuate accentuation. These erythematous patches that look like this, kind of nonspecific looking, and then they can get erith uh, co completely erythrodermic. This is usually a late presentation. You don't usually see this. And all that I'm going to be talking about the rest of today is not these patients. Um, but again, that, that arcuate type uh, look right here, and erythroderma. So let's talk about histology. If you look in textbooks of dermatopathology, and I know most of you who are not dermatopathologists would rather read the phone book than read a textbook of dermatopathology, <laughs> but that being said, if you look at the description of MF, it's fascinating. You see parakeratosis, big deal. You see that in everything. You see minimal spongiosis. You see, I like this, psoriasiform epidermal hyperplasia or atrophy. So the epidermis can be either too thick or too thin. That's very helpful. <laughs> Papillary dermal fibrosis, anything chronic gives you that, so that doesn't mean anything. But we're talking about a lymphoma, so this should be really helpful, right? So the lymphoid infiltrate can be sparse and perivascular, or it can be dense and lichenoid, or it can be large tumor nodules, i.e., it can be anything. Wait a minute. We're, we're, this makes no sense. But we have a few things that maybe do help. Potres, microabscesses, yeah, that's helpful, but if you read the, look, the textbook, it's in less than 5% cases, of cases. If you don't mind a 95% miss rate, that's a great criterion. <laughs> How about the lymphocytes? Well, they're hyperconvoluted and hyperchromatic, and they have marked epidermotropism, but in late lesions, you don't have any of that. Lymphocytes aligned along the dermal epidermal junction like toy soldiers. Well, that's a very pretty kind of thing, but what does it mean? Eosinophils, yeah, but all derm things have eosinophils. And plasma cells, well, wait, I thought we were talking about lymphoma. None of this makes any sense. Well, then we get to tumor stage, which I won't talk about today. And here we have, it looks like a lymphoma. 
but it doesn't have any of the features of MF. So if you're trying to make a diagnosis of MF on tumor stage MF, you can make a diagnosis of lymphoma, but unless you have the history, you don't know what's tumor stage, mycosis fungoides. Having said all of that, making fun of it, we'll get back to it in a minute. Psoriasiform epidermal hyperplasia. Notice there's very little in the way of an, uh, an infiltrate of lymphocytes in the dermis, but if you look at the epidermis, there are all these vacuolated areas. Those are lymphocytes with halos around the nucleus. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Here's the uh, infamous Pautrier's microabscess. We see them every once in a while. And this is a nice depiction of lots and lots of lymphocytes within the epidermis in the absence of significant spongiosis. If you look at most dermatologic diseases, you'll see lymphocytes in the epidermis, but you'll also see lots of spongiosis. So this, that's what's perhaps abnormal about this. And here they get to be a little bit more prominent in that you can see lots and lots of lymphocytes in this, and here are some big potrea microabscesses. Something like this is really not a diagnostic dilemma for, for anyone. So I decided, can we look at this and find any histologic criteria that can be used that will reliably distinguish MF from the whole range of rashes that look like MF to the dermatologists? We took two groups of patients. They were all seen in the dermatology <laughs> clinic and were thought to have a clinical suspicion of mycosis fungoides. All the patients we chose for this study had at least five years of follow-up. They had routine histologic sections, and back when we did this study, frozen lymphocyte immunophenotyping studies. The first group were 64 patients that absolutely had MF, as far as anyone could possibly tell. Based upon a clinical course for five years that was consistent with it, a response to treatment that was consistent with it, and this parameter, immunophenotypic evidence of a CD4 positive infiltrate with surface antigen abnormalities. I'll come back to that. Bear with me right now. But that's the other criterion we used. I'll come back to what that means later. Then we had 47 patients. Remember, they came in as clinical suspicion of MF. They were biopsied, sent to pathology as, is this MF? Again, five years of follow-up. These patients clearly, ultimately did not have MF, as best anyone could tell. They responded to treatment for something else. It went away. They clearly, no one thought they had MF. And again, the immunophenotyping at the time of the initial biopsy could not support a diagnosis of MF. We had no idea what the histology looked like when we took these 100 and whatever the math is patients there. And we took all the slides from the biopsies that were done at the first visit, threw them into a box completely randomly. Had no idea which ones were from the patients that ultimately were decided had MF and the ones that didn't. And the dependent variables were here were the histologic criteria. Let's look at these slides and see, can we predict retrospectively which ones had MF and which ones didn't? And we looked at these. I took all of those things I made fun of at the beginning, and I thought, let's put them as independent parameters. Let's look at every single one of them and see, do any of them pan out? Or is this just total nonsense, which was a possibility? It's like, we don't know what we're doing. I really did wonder about that. I enjoyed this perinuclear lymphocytic halos. When Neil Smith from England wrote about this, I thought it was funny. It's like, you got to be kidding me. Now remember that. Um, but we looked at all the things that I talked about. And then we looked at some things also that I talked about that clearly are not specific, just to see, does anything pan out? When we do all of this, do, do we get anything? We, we had a four-point scale for each parameter. And every single slide was reviewed by two or three people who I think were going to kill me by the end of this study. This was unbelievably tedious. And we fought like steer to identify what does a one or a two or a three mean until we could get there. And ultimately, we got to the point where we hated each other's guts, but we agreed on what was a one or a two or a three. And what did we find? Well, single epidermal lymphocytes was seen in two-thirds of the MF cases but was also seen in a quarter of the non-MF cases. Hmm, that's not really very helpful. Potrier's microabscesses. This is an interesting number I can't really explain. In our little group statistics, we had 38% have Potrier's microabscesses. That is bizarre. We shouldn't have. We should have had 5, 6, 7%. I don't know why we did, but we did. 
Partrase microabscesses could be defined as two or three or four or 14, whatever lymphocytes in one cluster. I think we used three, as I recall. I don't know why we saw so many. Remember what I said about halos around lymphocytes? Look at the p-value. There were a lot of zeros there before you got to a positive integer. Very, very good statistical thing. When you see halos around the lymphocytes, probably it's an artifact, cytoplasm that's retracted. So you end up with a little bit of space around the lymphocytes. Maybe those lymphocytes are a little bit atypical. They have some cytoplasm more than reactive ones. The rest of these things, statistical significance, dermal fibrosis, notice, not significant. Anything that's chronic and has T cells in the dermis for any period of time is going to give you papillary dermal fibrosis. It tells you it's chronic. It doesn't tell you it's MF. These other things turned out to be not particularly useful. Interesting, lymphocytic mitoses. That will pan out in late stage MF as a prognostic feature, but in early diagnostic MF, you almost never see one, so it's not helpful. So <clears throat> on a multivariate analysis, it turned out that the most robust predictor were the halos around lymphocytes. OK, so I was wrong. Or at least in my own study, it turned out I found the same thing that the fellow from England had described. These other things turned out to approach statistical significance and may be helpful. So maybe we didn't have enough cases with all the different parameters we looked at. I'm not a statistician, but that would be one explanation for why we didn't have more powerful announcement to make at the end of this. Or maybe some of these variables clustered together so that in the presence of lymphocytes with halos, you get lots of single cells or something like that. So our conclusion was we do think that you can reliably distinguish MF from inflammatory mimics using histologic criteria in the majority of cases. What I had hoped was that at the end of this study, we would be able to say, if you took two times the square root of a negative number of lymphocytes times one third the slope of x and come up with a mathematical formula, we didn't have one. So where are we? Most of the time, we probably can tell it's not random. If you have lymphocytes with halos, potrias, microabscesses, these hyperconvoluted epidermal lymphocytes, and I actually now think maybe the halos and the hyperconvoluted in the dermis, especially the halos, are interesting. And disproportionate exocytosis, lymphocytes going into the epidermis, very little spongiosis. That most of the time, that is pretty strongly suggestive. Prospectively, I haven't done this study because I'm no longer in a place where we have an MF patient every week. Is lymphocyte atypia reproducible? This was kind of a bombshell study because if you read every article and you listen to everybody in the world, they talk about, well, clearly they have atypical lymphocytes in mycosis fungoides. And I thought, well, what if you didn't have architecture? What if you just had cytologic atypia? Is it there or isn't it? Can you actually say there really is lymphocyte atypia that can distinguish MF cells from reactive T cells? Because I think reactive T cells can look pretty atypical. So in this study, we took 30 cases. Again, people who clearly had patch stage MF because I'm interested in the early diagnosis, not the late diagnosis. So these early lesions, patch stage MF, and 30 patients who clearly had spongiotic dermatitis, contact dermatitis, or something like that. We took a total of 92 photomicrographs that I had my fellow take pictures of, so I couldn't be biased. I had my fellow take pictures at 40x and oil immersion and 100x. Just, I don't want any architecture, I just want cells. Don't tell me which ones came from which, just give me a bunch of slides. Cells, no architecture because that will bias us. We're talking about lymphocyte atypia. We took these slides. They were Kodachromes back then. You may remember them, some of you who are archivists. Um, and we sent them to seven pathologists, five dermatopathologists, because after all, we're talking about derm path. And then I thought, you know what? What do we know? Why don't we talk to the lymphoma experts? Let's send them to some hematopathologists. They just got these slides in a box. Just tell me, atypia, not atypia. Nothing else, just atypical or not atypical. I don't want somewhere in the middle. It either is or it isn't. And this was uh, one such case taken from an MF1, and this is one from a spongiotic dermatitis one. That's what they got to look at. No architecture. We're talking about cytologic atypia. Is it there or isn't it? Guess what we found? 
Atypical lymphocytes were present in about half the cases of MF and about half the cases of spongiotic dermatitis in the epidermis. Well, the dermis is different. It was seen in about half the cases of epi uh, MF and half the cases of spongiotic dermatitis in the dermis. When you looked at the individual observer, atypia went from 25% of the slides to 75% of the slides. Seven of the seven observers agreed in 9% of the cases. Holy smokes, what are we doing? In six out of seven of the cases, we got another 10%. So, my conclusion from this modern pathology article, or, or yeah, was atypia is in the eyes of the beholder. I actually do think that if you go up to high magnification and concentrate and say, oh, that's clearly MF because of this cell, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I think that if you take those cells in the context of the architectural changes, OK, but then you're not using pure cytologic atypia. You're using a constellation of histologic findings. Now, I, I, I need to say, when you get to late stage disease, you're talking about big, blasty looking lymphocytes. There, there is some atypia. I, I, I don't mean to do. This was such a saying of mine once upon a time that one of the dermatologists cross-stitched or whatever it's called, this thing, which sat in my office for years. <laughs> By the way, in an atypical fibrosanthoma, I know what atypia is. It's just in this context. What about epitheliotropism? <clears throat> Folliculocentric and eccrine coil tropism by these T cells has been described, but it's always sort of like sometimes you see this. So we decided to look, does this stand out as a useful discriminating histologic feature. So we, again, took 104 patients who had absolutely unequivocally MF and 20 people who clearly didn't but had spongiotic dermatitis and were thought to be MF, et cetera. We were looking for this. Lymphocytes going into the eccrine coils or densely around them or going into and densely around the hair follicles. It does turn out, and this is, this is interesting, and now there have been several articles written about this since. Eccrine coil infiltration by lymphocytes is seen in about 30% of cases of MF. Well, you're going to have a 70% miss rate if you use it as a sole criterion. It's an interesting thing to look at because most inflammatory dermatoses, albeit lupus does, lichen striatus does, but most inflammatory dermatoses tend to leave the eccrine structures alone for the most part. So when they're going in there, that's an interesting architectural feature that may be helpful. Again, follicular epithelial involvement, yes, it happens. I could think of lots of diseases that give you folliculitis, but again, you do see it. You also get eccrine ductular hyperplasia. Which, um, which is something that hadn't been written about, but now it's been written about by a couple of European groups. And follicular mucinosis, which has been talked about, completely different explosive topic. So maybe helpful, again, not a standalone criterion. All right, so I've blown up the idea that we have anything, any idea what we're doing with making a diagnosis. So now how about predicting? Who's going to do well and who's not going to do well? We're so good at diagnosing, let's predict. Took 46 patients. These again from, were from Stanford. 21 patients with photographic evidence had five years of incredibly stable disease. You couldn't tell picture one from picture five days, five years later. And 26 patients had rapidly progressive disease. Now I have to tell you, I'll get back to this in a little while. That's unusual. Most patients with MF do not have rapidly progressive disease. They die with their disease, not of the disease, and it's a 30-year life course. So finding 26 patients with rapidly progressive disease, you had to have Stanford's mycosis fungoides clinic to even find that group of patients. So this is not at all a random thing. We took those, remember those histologic parameters from way back when that everybody hated me for? We went back to them. And we decided we were going to do the same thing, looking at these patients and saying, can we tell, based on this histologic observa observation, which ones did well, which ones didn't do well. Again, threw the slides in a box. We had no idea who were the bad actors and the good actors. We just looked. Oh, this was fascinating. The epidermis was thicker in patients who did worse. If that seems like who cares and that's ridiculous, it's pretty much true. Other trends, a bunch of this. The bottom line is 
we have absolutely no way, based on routine histology, to pick out the patients with MF that are actually going to fall <coughs> off the curve and do very poorly from those that are going to do just fine for 30 years. That's a little bit disappointing, but in fact, that's quite true to this day, as far as I know. Mitotic rate. While people talk about mitotic rate being a predictive value in mycosis fungoides, they're talking about later stage diseases, not this early stage 1A patch stage disease, where again, you virtually never see one. Okay, I've beaten up on histology. Now let's beat up on immunohistochemistry. Uh, for time immemorial, at least since we knew what CD4 was, MF was defined as a proliferation of CD4 positive lymphocytes. Then the WHO decided, well, kind of, sort of. Now, it's also CD8 positive lymphocytes that are epidermotropic. I'll go on record as saying I also hate that decision, and I'll tell you why. Some patients with epidermotropic CD8 positive lymphoma have a very aggressive clinical course. Histologically, they look very much like MF, but their clinical behavior is really different. So again, why are we lumping? I am very much a lumper. I, I couldn't care less which type of seborrheic keratosis it is. It's a seborrheic keratosis. Move on to something that matters. It doesn't matter. Just call it. But this matters. So we shouldn't be lumping. We should be splitting. But though I sit on the WHO thing, I said my piece, and then I shut up. OK. Also, what's been described is that there is a decrease in some surface antigens on the T cells in mycosis fungoides. Much of this work was done at Stanford during the time I was there, and it was a really exciting bit of work. So even though I'm going to trash talk it now, I'm part of it. So I'm not making fun of other people's work. After we decided, oh, look at this, CD7 is absent in MF, therefore we can make a diagnosis easily, it turns out lots of things have CD7 negativity. So, OK, what does it mean? You can see it in lymphomatoid papulosis. You can see it in parapsoriasis. More about that later. But what does that mean? I don't know. It's an interesting disease and a bunch of other stuff. In an ideal world, MF looks like this, CD3, CD4. And if you compare CD4 and CD8, it looks something like that. OK, that's pretty easy. That's, so this should be easy. Who cares about histology? We just use immunohistochemistry and make a diagnosis. It's easy, right? OK, so let's take a look. What is the role of lymphocyte immunophenotyping in making the diagnosis of these early lesions? This should be easy, right? Look at the number of cases. We had 265 consecutive cases submitted to rule out mycosis fungoides over this period of time. All of these patients back then, we used frozen tissue. We wouldn't anymore, but when we did this study, we did. We got rid of 22 cases because we really could not figure out what those patients had. And we wanted this to be pure as best we could. These guys clearly have MF. These guys clearly don't have MF. Let's see, what did we learn from immunohistochemistry? We looked at the histology this time, and we made a diagnosis. We were not allowed to be pathologists. We had to say MF or not MF. No waffling, no suspicious, no consistent, no it could be. It either is or it isn't. Pull the trigger, which is it based on the histology? Just commit yourself. Then we looked at all of the immuno studies on all of these patients. Now, back in those days, Roger Warnke and Ron Dorfman and all my buddies at Stanford were doing every CD that had been described from CD1 through CD whatever we were up to back then. And we did them all on every single patient on frozen tissue. And we looked at every single one of those things to see what did we find? What did we learn from doing all of this? We forgot about the histology. We put that aside. Now we had a new table, and we had two choices, MF and not MF. Predominantly CD4, positive infiltrate. And here's something where if I had to do it over again, I would do it differently now, but at the time, this was good. Decreased staining of at least one of these pan T cell antigens, which we defined back then as less than 30%. The literature has now moved to less than 10%, and I suspect our results would look different now but I don't have the patience, the time, or any friends left to redo this study with 10% as a cutoff. So if there were criteria were not met, it was not MF. Then it was really simple. We took one table with MF, not MF, and compared it to the other table with MF, not MF. What do we find? What we found is that in about 3 quarters of the cases, there was complete agreement. 
The MF was on the histology. The MF was on the immunoperoxidase. That's wonderful. And that didn't matter whether it was yes or no. It was about three quarters of the cases. Well, let's look at the other ones. In 35 of 151 cases, or about a quarter, where we made a diagnosis of MF on the, uh, on the um, histology, the IPOX was, or immunoperoxidase was not MF. There was a dis discrepancy. Were those false negatives? Yes, because later, when we did them again, they panned out that they found a CD7 deficiency or whatever. So they caught up eventually. Let's look at the other ones. There were 20 cases where the histology was not MF, but the immunoperoxidase diagnosis to us was, that's MF. So were those false positives? Whoa, that's an interesting finding. It turned out that in a total of 4% of these 260 cases, the histology caught up with the immunoperoxidase, and they did ultimately develop MF. Well, that's fantastic. We're diagnosing things 5% of the time. We're making an early diagnosis by using immunoperoxidase. And the other ones, not so much. We're either confirming what we thought or not doing much of anything except running up the price, whatever you said about me and not spending lots of money. We're spending lots of money. So this 4% early detection rate is fantastic except for one thing. There was a study published in Archives of Dermatology about 19 around 2000, I think. I actually was not part of this study, but a whole bunch of my buddies who were clinical dermatologists from Stanford published this. They had 30-year cohort of dermatology patients who came in with MF, stage 1A, and not MF. Guess what the life expectancy was? And it's a 41-year longitudinal study. Having MF doesn't make a darn bit of difference in your life expectancy. So why are we spending a fortune doing all of these immunostains to come up with an earlier detection rate of 4% on a disease that doesn't matter. It doesn't change your life expectancy. And what's also been shown is that early intervention does absolutely nothing to alter the course of this di disease. This is not melanoma. A 5% early detection rate on melanoma is going to save lives. We should be doing that. But in MF, we're not saving any lives. What are we doing? We're just spending a fortune making a diagnosis a few months earlier. So what did we find? The other ones that had these false positives on immunos, if you will, were the kinds of things that have been described by lots of people over time. But I like some of these. A bug bite. Interesting. Annular elastolytic granuloma. For those of you who don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. But it's not mycosis fungoides. It has no significance in terms of life or death. And what we found was pretty much what everyone has found ever since. CD7's the biggie. So once in a while, you pick up an earlier case. Most of the time, you're patting yourself on the head and saying, yes, 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 what you think is right based on H&A. It helps, kind of, sort of, makes you feel better about your diagnosis. Maybe it's best when you're not really sure and you think, well, gee, if this were CD7 deficient, I would feel a little bit better that maybe it really is MF. But if I don't see that, should I not call it MF? I think not. What's interesting, and I'll come back to this again later, I think, um, I don't actually do immuno studies. You think, oh my god, I wrote 25 papers about this over, what am I doing? I think it's all been superseded. I think there's no reason to do it anymore. I realize, and I, I freely admit, my colleague, Glenna Scott, who I think is a tremendous dermatopathologist, does the whole panel on every single case. And I look at her and say, why are you doing that? I wrote the papers. Why are you doing that? And she is absolutely wedded to it. She bought it all. She likes the CD7 deficiency and all of that. And she does it all the time. I never do. I do a CD4 and CD8 because I am not of the belief that they are all the same disease. And I want to know if they're epidermotropic CD8s so I can make a statement about that. So let's look at molecular. It's been shown that there's a clonal rearrangement of the T cell receptor in some cases. Gamma delta much, much less commonly, and I'm not sure whether that's even going to be the same disease. How sensitive are they? Well, they're pretty sensitive. It says 80 to 90 here. I think most places now would say probably most, case, most places are getting probably 90% or more sensitivity. Specificity, pretty specific. Well, that's great, wonderful. Um, obviously, the bigger and the thicker and the more aggressive the tumor is, the more likely you're going to see clonal rearrangement. So when we're pushing the early side, 
Again, sensitivity and specificity not so great. But remember, as I say to all my residents all the time, a fool with a stool, tool is still a fool. If you get T-cell gene rearrangements on everything, you're going to wish you hadn't. Because you're going to find the most incredible things that show clonal rearrangement. And then you're going to be on the phone explaining to clinicians why this patient with bug bites probably doesn't have lymphoma. So <laughs> be careful. When I was much younger, uh, there was an article in the American Journal uh, I guess it was in, uh, in the American Journal of Dermatopathology, written by a very famous dermatopathologist, entitled something to the effect of small plaque parasoriasis is mycosis fungoides. Well, any clinical dermatologist would say, actually, small plaque parasoriasis is a pretty easy diagnosis to make. You walk into a room, and someone looks like you slapped them on their flanks, and you see thumbprints on their flanks. That's what it looks like. MF doesn't really look like that. They're not these tiny little thumbprints. And no one really believed this, but this guy said this, and it's like, oh, come on, this is insane. I was actually sitting in, in an airplane when I read this, and it was a good thing I was wearing my seatbelt, because I, I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I came back to, to, to school, and uh, Gary Wood, a good friend of mine who works at Cleveland, uh, Case Western Reserve now, um, called me and said, hey, Bruce, in your frozen database, you've got five cases of small plaque parasoriasis. I remember saving them. Would you just get those out? and do gene rearrangement studies on these things and blow this paper out of the water. Just say, this is total nonsense. So yeah, that's easy. You know, science never works the way you hoped it would. <laughs> Guess what we found? Two of the patients showed a clonal T cell rearrangement. Holy smokes, is the guy right? Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it is MF. So we called these patients. Hadn't been seen in decades. We I had a, a resident or a fellow, somebody track them down. And we found the patients. One of them was like, what are you talking about? I haven't had a rash in 35 years. What are you, crazy? And the other one was like, yeah, I got the same rash I had 25 years ago. Nothing's happened. So hmm, what does the clonal rearrangement mean? And is this MF? Who knows? So I am a total nihilist, I guess, as I get old. But <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Everybody always wants to do gene rearrangement studies. It's like, OK. What are you going to do with this thing if it turns out to be positive? And I have a very high bar in that if the lesions are very suspicious, the histology is suspicious, but you can't pull the trigger. And you're thinking, if I had one more piece of data, I would make a diagnosis in MF. And there's some incredible reason why you need to treat the patient now, then we should do gene rearrangement studies. If the last criterion is not met, what are you doing? Come back in six months. We'll see what you look like. If you got worse disease, we'll try again and make a diagnosis. If you don't, let's just leave it alone and keep following it. Remember, your clinical course isn't changed by intervening. There are some studies that suggest if you have multiple skin sites showing the same clone, that may have a worse prognosis. If that's true, and that pans out, I will change my thinking. Because then we probably should do it. See if we have two, clone, two sites, same clone, worse disease, great. But so far, that's not yet been replicated. So I don't know if that's true. It's been 15 years since that was published. A bunch of other studies. 26 patients with MF looked for BCL2, key 67. BCL2 is wonderful. It's in every single lymphocyte in every single patient. So that's helpful. Let's just do it. We'll spend some more money. Waste money. It means nothing. How about key 67? Again, doesn't help. It's really, really, really low in all patients with early patch stage MF. Loss of heterozygosity. Let's look for chromosome imbalance in these neoplastic disorders. We looked at 25 biopsies from 19 patients. These were later, plaque and tumor stage. We took some, we did a micro dissection and we did LOH, loss of heterozygosity for eight different loci, which had been described previously as maybe having something to do with MF. And we did this cutesy little thing where we scooped out these little bits and we got lots of lymphocytes. And we looked at these things, um, tumor suppressor genes and things that had been described in some patients with MF. What we found is that most patients sort of 
had one loss of heterozygosity at one locus. They were kind of all over the board. The patients who had progressive disease had more chrom chromosome instability. And again, they're all over the place. So it's associated with progression of disease. P10 may or may not play any role in any of this. It also may not. We actually looked using immunostains at P10, and we stained here patch, plaque, tumor, granulomatous MF, the whole group of MF patients. What does P10 mean here? It means nothing. I forgot to say that looking at this slide. It really didn't help us at all. Then we get into some science that clearly is above my pay grade. STAT3 is constitutively activated in tumor stage MF. There's increased proliferation and apoptosis. That's in tumor stage. What about patch stage? Tumor stage is easy. It's not a hard thing. It's lymphoma. Who needs to do STAT3? Just look at it. H&E will tell you that's a lymphoma. P1415-16 associated with dysregulation of cell cycle is seen in some cases, and fast gene also seen. Now, these might be useful therapeutically. There may be a reason to get involved here, but in terms of making a diagnosis, not so much. Um, early clonal event, maybe, maybe not. Lots of, if this sounds like it's all over the place, it's all over the place. Nobody has any idea what's going on here with these cells and why they become neoplastic. The International <laughs> Society of Cutaneous Lymphoma decided they were gonna fix this mess. They were gonna come up with a one size fits all Instant solution, everybody can make a diagnosis of MS. MF, it's a four point scale. You get four points, you make MF. If you don't get four points, you don't make MF. So it was based on clinical, um, persistent or progressive patches or thin plaques, like I described, or if these other histologic fe uh, clinical features like whether it's sun exposed, what the lesions looked like, whether there was poikiloderma, those are another point. Histology. A superficial lymphoid infiltrate gets you a point. Everybody in this room has a superficial lymphocyte, uh, lymphoid infiltrate, so everybody gets one point for just breathing. I mean, it, but it's like, it's a fascinating thing that you get a point for that, but you get two extra points. If, uh, you get an extra point if you see epidermotropism without spongiosis or lymphoid atypia. I've already told you what I think of that. Molecular, if you have a clonal gene rearrangement, gene rearrangement you get a point for that. And immunopathology, if you got less than 10 CD7s, you get a point for that. If you get four points, you got MF. These guys, last year, a couple of years ago, decided they'd look at that. It turned out that 21 out of 24 patients, well, that's pretty good, met four points. But 40% of the patients who didn't have MF also got four points. So while the specificity was sort of good, the, uh, the sensitivity, the specificity was god awful. So this fantastic tool that's gonna help us make a diagnosis turns out to be essentially useless. So much for the International Society of, Clinical, of Cutaneous Lymphoma, of which I think I'm a member. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people are trying, we're just drawn blanks. It's not that, I mean, I, I really don't mean to be negative. We're, we're all trying. Um, basically, there's a fundamental defect in T cell activation. Malignancy of skin homing T CD4 memory cells that have a defect that's affecting their normal activation. This is a theory that Sean Whitaker, a really smart guy from England, has put forth. And maybe this has something to do, may, may have some basis in reality. And then there's this one that I talked about really early on, the chronic antigen stimulation. There's clonal expansion from some group of T cells that's exposed to the same antigen for day after day, week after week, year after year, and eventually they transform and they become malignant. That may be why the biologic behavior is like it is, where you sit with one rash for 20 years and it doesn't do anything. It makes sense when you look at the patients. Is it true? It's hand waving. It may be true. Um, I should mention, HTLV1 is almost certainly not implicated. It has been looked at by six million people in six million different ways. It's not there, probably not. CMV, EBV, other lymphomas, yes, not this one. Interesting, other CTCLs, but not this one, which is why CTCL really doesn't work. It's not related to EBV. Staph aureus, oh sure, well why not? You know, everybody's got a little of that. Why not make it cause MF? Um, I don't want to talk about it.
Couple of other little things, I've got a few minutes. Cesare syndrome. Basically think of this as the leukemic phase of MF. Those same atypical or not lymphocytes that are in our skin lose their homing receptor. And instead of going up into the epidermis, which is what makes it that you don't die from it probably, they lose that. And all of a sudden, now they're circulating around your entire body. Easy to diagnose, kind of, if you have circulating lymphocytes exceeding a number. They usually are bright red, and these patients are sick. These patients do need therapeutic intervention, and they have a very bad prognosis. But it's really hard to diagnose on skin biopsy, but try and convince any clinicians of that. They've got a patient who's bright red and sick as all get up, and they do a biopsy, and they get, well, I don't really know what this is. It's not specific. So we actually took a look to see, is the problem me, or is the problem that there really is a problem diagnosing this on a skin biopsy? So we took 26 patients who had documented Cesare syndrome, and we looked at the immunologic abnormalities, again, compared to 64 patients with PATH stage. Histology. We, we did that same thing with that big long table and we looked, we, we were good, we knew what we were doing. What do we find in terms of histology? There's more parakeratosis in Cesare syndrome. Yeah, great. What's that going to do for anybody? Oh, and there's also more acanthosis. That's good. The epidermis is thicker. But if you look, the real problem is when you move down the list here, single lymphocytes along the dermal epidermal junction, it's less in Cesare syndrome. Um, Hyperconvoluted dermal, dermal lymphocytes. Hmm, what does this mean? The cells that are so epidermotropic have lost their epidermotropism. So all of the criteria we use histologically to make a diagnosis of MF are gone. They're not there anymore. That's why the patients are sick, presumably. Um, bottom line for clinicians, if you think a patient's got Cesare syndrome, don't even bother doing a biopsy. We're not going to help you. We're going to tell you something nonspecific. It's going to be not epidermotropic. Lymphocyte atypia, sure. You can put oil on anything. It'll look atypical. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be anything specific. What about immunophenotyping? It turns out that if you do flow, you get a ratio of 10 to 1 or something like that. It's going to be of CD4 to CD8, and you have loss of CD7 or whatever. You're going to be able to make a diagnosis of Cesare pretty well. What if you try that on a skin biopsy? So being creative, I thought we should try that on a skin biopsy. We took 13 patients with Cesare, 14 with spongiotic dermatitis, and we did double labeling. Oh, cool. So we did double labeling with CD4 and CD8, and it didn't matter whether we used red and brown, flipping them either way. We tried it both ways just to see whether there was some problem with the chromogen that might be affecting it. And what we found is nothing. Um, the sensitivity and the specificity come up with, don't do it on a skin biopsy. If you want to know what the ratio is, do flow on blood. Don't, don't even bother with a skin biopsy. We're not helpful. So it's not reliable. It's not going to help you at all. Do flow cytometry in patients. Then we took this one, Warringer Collip disease. Derm has the greatest names. What's really great is that we sit around and we make up names so that no one knows what we're talking about. It ensures forever that we can be employed because we're the only ones who speak our language. It's a very cynical thing, but you wonder at some point. We have all of these polysyllabic gobbledygook. What does it all mean? Warringer and Kalb were two dermatologists from, I think, Germany, I don't know, 150 years ago or something, who got together and decided that there was a localized form of mycosis fungoides where it's super indolent. But it's really, really easy to diagnose on H&E because there's tons and tons of epidermotropism and lots of uh, 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 potrease microabscesses. But it's MF, clearly. Puh. So we thought we'd look at seven patients with this um, that had histology that was identical to MF. What we found was really interesting. On H&E, it was not a uniform group of patients. It, I mean, excuse me, on immunohistochemistry, it was very heterogeneous. They were both CD4 positive, some were CD8 positive, and interestingly, a lot of them were CD30 positive. In early patch stage MF, CD30 is 1%, 2% of cells. It's not there. In fact, blastic transformation may be a prognostic feature. But early MF doesn't have CD30 positivity. Some of these orange or collop patients were entirely CD30 positive. Are they really MF patients? Interesting. So 
Again, the WHO classifies this as a variant of MF. I'm not really sure I believe that's true. It's an epidermotropic clonal proliferation of T cells, but is this MF? I don't know. So, summarizing this big, long odyssey, I do think most of the time, in conjunction with good clinical history and the right clinical context, routine histology can give you a pretty good call on whether something is or isn't mycosis fungoides. It cannot even come close to telling you how the patient is going to do. I think that's out there. I think we will find a molecular fingerprint or a series of molecular fingerprints that the lymphocytes that are going to be bad actors will look this way and the good actors will look this way. But it's not under my microscope. Immunophenotyping, I don't know, maybe I have a polar extreme position at this point in time. CD4, CD8, CD7, maybe that makes some sense. CD30, just to make sure that you're not seeing a big blastic transformation. But I don't know why you would do anything more than that, and I'm not even totally committed to that, but it's okay. Genotyping, yeah, if you're close, and if you're going to do something different with the patient in here, a good relationship with the dermatologist is probably important. They can do a lot of things, topical steroids, even UV therapy, things like that, without having a slam dunk diagnosis of MF. They probably don't want to give interleukin or some, you know, do plasmapheresis or things like that if they, you kind of think they do. They probably want a diagnosis for that. But what we should do before we go spend $500 on a test that's neither 100% sensitive or 100% specific, we ought to find out what's going to happen if it's positive, what's going to happen if it's negative. And if we don't have a real good answer, why are we doing it? Cesare syndrome. Urge your clinicians not to do a skin biopsy, to draw some blood. I haven't ever seen what the number is. It would be really interesting to do a study and see where does it take off. It's pretty well known that when patients undergo so-called blastic transformation and they have now what looks like a large cell lymphoma that grew out of their MF, they have a more aggressive um, course. They do worse. Can we find the earliest stage? We couldn't do it with immunohistochemistry based on routine package, but CD30, is there a magic number that once you hit 5%, next week it's going to be 10 and then it's going to be 40? I don't know. That's not out there. That would be an interesting to look at. It'd be interesting to look at um, nodal disease and non-nodal disease to see can we predict anything there. I, I once got interested in the concept of doing FNAs on skin biopsies and doing cytopathology. If we're really talking about lymphocyte atypia, wouldn't that be the way to go? Never done it. I always thought that might be fun. And it might also be fun to do trafficking studies. And so we come back to our friend um, from Hôpital Saint-Louis. And what I'm happy to say is that you really rarely, rarely, rarely see tumor phase, tumor stage mycosis fungoides. This makes for really cool opening and closing slides, but most patients don't look like this. So thank you for bearing with me and my odyssey. I'm happy to answer any questions as you may have them. Thank you. Yes. I don't really know what to do with the staging, but I would be more concerned about a patient who had the same clone in both the skin and the blood. Again, going back to that article from 2002, that's kind of interesting. If there's the same clone of cells with the same rearrangement, going around, that's more concerning to me than a localized single lesion. Think the Warringer Collip patients who have a single localized lesion for 30 years and it never goes anywhere. As long as it's not going anywhere, well, it doesn't look so good, but you're not going to die. If it's in the blood, I think that's concerning. I have absolutely no scientific evidence for that. It's just my gut feeling. Oh, no, then I'm in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, in uh, trying to understand what's probably going on here, that makes sense, but I, I haven't seen that written anywhere that, oh, you should definitely, if you're going to do one in the skin, do one in the blood, see if they're the same and act differently. That, that makes sense, but I haven't ever seen that. <laughs>
Did they have the same clone of the skin in, <coughs> at the same time? I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Because that would be more interesting to me, I think. Well, we put the paper in the system, so it's going to be easy. So, going back to the biology question, then, and this is actually more towards the MF that remains stable over decades. Has anyone actually had a population that has been able to look at other biomarkers and say, well, this is the actual MF that is the MF that could actually, is it, is it actually an altered interaction between? There, there actually is that whole ICAM-1 and LFA-1 relationship between the, the cells that the HECA-452 antibody that, go, that draws them up into the epidermis and keeps them there. I don't know the answer about a longitudinal what happens and whether anything changes in the patients that yeah, lose that. That, that would be interesting. But that's clearly what early MF has, lots of this interaction that either draws or keeps the lymphocytes up in the epidermis. <laughs> One would assume that goes away. Uh, at some, I mean, it does. If you look at tumor stage, that relationship's not there anymore. But I don't know what keeps it there for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I've done some renal pathology in my day. And uh, I, I, I was reminded of the interstitial arthritis in renal pathology and the lymphocytes that go from the interstitium into and they all have halos. So this gets back to the issue of what do halos mean? Because these are not coral. And I think that that's right. Uh, I'm, I don't really know. In, and within the epidermis, I never really believed it. But I actually think sometimes you could see that same thing in the, in the dermis. And what I'm just wondering about is, does it just mean that the cells are a little bit bigger and they have some cytoplasm? To me, that doesn't mean MF. It just means lymphocytes that have a little bit more cytoplasm that can contract. I don't know what to do with it. I mean, I, I, just because we found it, I mean, it's the same thing as Neil Smith. I made fun of it because it seems kind of ridiculous. I was surprised ours came out the same way. I honestly don't know what it means. But I do look for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have more questions. Just a thank you, Thank you all.